everyone. Um, welcome to the review session for Quiz Zero, which is taking place this Wednesday. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, um, I'm with uh, three other TFs, and together we're going to go through um, um, a review of what we've done in the course so far. It's not going to be 100% comprehensive, but it should give you a better idea of what you already have down and what you still need to study before Wednesday. Um, and feel free to raise your hand with questions as we're going along. <coughs> keep in mind that we'll also have a, um, a little bit of time at the end, um, if we get through with a few minutes to spare, to do general questions. Um, so keep those in mind. And so we're going to start at the beginning um, with week zero. But before we do that, let's just talk about um, the logistics of the quiz. So it is on Wednesday, October 10th. That's this Wednesday. And if you go to this URL here, which is also accessible from csfg.net, there's a link to it. Um, you can see information about where to go based on your last name um, or school affiliation, as well as details about exactly what the quiz will cover and the types of questions that you're going to get. Um, keep in mind that you'll also have a chance to review for the quiz in section. Um, so your, your TF should be going over some practice problems, and that's another good chance to see kind of where you still need to, to study up for the quiz. So let's start at the beginning with um, bits and bytes. So remember, a bit is just a 0 or a 1, and a byte is a collection of 8 of those bits. Um, so let's look at, the, at this collection of bits right here. Um, we should be able to figure out how many bits there are when we count there's just 8 of them, eight, you know, 0 or 1 units. And since there's 8 bits, that's 1 byte. Um, and let's convert it to hexadecimal. So hexadecimal is base 16, and it's pretty easy to convert um, a number in binary, which is what that is, to a number in hexadecimal. All we do is we look at groups of four, um, and we convert them to the appropriate um, hexadecimal digit. So we start um, with the rightmost group of four. So 0011, that's going to be 1, 1, and 1, 2. So together that makes three. And then um, let's look at the other block of four, 1101, that's going to be 1, 1, 1, 4, and 1, 8. So together that's going to be 13, which makes D. Um, and we'll remember that uh, in hexadecimal, we don't just go 0 through 9, we go 0 through F. So after 9, 10 corresponds to A, 11 to B, et cetera, um, where F is 15. So here 13 is a D. Um, and then finally, uh, to, to convert it to decimal, um, all we do is we actually um, just treat each position as a power of 2. So that's um, 1, 1, 1, 2, 0, 4, 0, 8, 1, 16, et cetera. And it's a little hard to, to compute in your head, but if we go to the next slide, we can see the answer to that. Um, essentially, we're just going across from right, from right, back to left, and we're multiplying each digit by a power, by the corresponding power of 2. Um, and remember, for hexadecimal, we denote these numbers with 0x <coughs> at the beginning, so we don't confuse it with a decimal number. Um, so, continuing on, this is an ASCII table. And what we use ASCII for is to um, map from characters to numerical values. <coughs> so if you remember, in the cryptography piece set, we made extensive use of the ASCII table in order to um, use various methods of cryptography, the Caesar and the Visionaire cipher, to, um, to convert different letters um, in a string according to the key given by the user. <coughs> so let's look at a little bit of ASCII math. Um, we uh, look, looking at the character P and adding one in character form. That would just be Q. Um, and remember that um, the character five is not equal to the number five. Um, and how exactly would we convert between those two forms? It's actually not too hard. Um, in order to get the number five, we just subtract the character zero because there are five um, places between the character zero and the character five. In order to go the other way, um, we just add the zero. So it's sort of like regular arithmetic, just remembering that when, it, when something has quotes around it, it's a character um, and thus corresponds to a value in the ASCII table. All right, so moving into more general computer science topics, we learned what an algorithm is and how <coughs> we use programming to implement algorithms. Um, so some examples of algorithms are something really simple, like checking whether a number is even or odd. For that, remember, we just mod the number by 2 and check if the result is 0. If so, it's even. If not, it's odd. And that's an example of a really basic algorithm. A little bit of a more involved one is binary search, um, which we'll go over later in the review session. 
And programming is just what we, uh, the term we use for taking an algorithm and converting it to code that a computer can read. So an example of, um, two examples of programming um, is, so, so Scratch, which is what we did in week zero, um, even though we don't actually type out the code, um, it's a way of implementing this algorithm, which is printing the numbers one through 10. And here we do the same in, in the C programming language. So these are functionally equivalent, just um, written in different languages or, or syntax. So we then learned about Boolean expressions. Um, and a Boolean is just a value that's either true or false. And here, um, we oftentimes Boolean expressions go inside of conditions. So if x is less than or equal to 5, well, we already said x equal to 5. So that condition is going to evaluate to true. And if it's true, whatever code is beneath the condition is going to be evaluated by the computer. So um, that string is going to be printed to standard output. And the, um, the, actually the term condition <coughs> refers to whatever is inside the parentheses of the if statement. Remember um, to learn all of these, uh, remember all the operators. Um, remember it's double and and double or when, when we're trying to combine you know, two or more conditions. Um, double equals, not single equals, um, to check whether two things are equal. Remember that single equals is for assignment, whereas double equals is um, a Boolean operator. Um, less than or equal to, equal to, greater than or equal to, and then the final two are, are self-explanatory. Um, so a general review of Boolean logic here. And Boolean expressions are also important in loops, um, which we'll go over now. So we learned about three types of loops so far in CS50, for, while, and do while. And it's important to know that while for most purposes we can actually use any type of loop, but generally there are certain types of uh, purposes or, or common patterns in programming that specifically call for one of these loops um, that make it the most efficient or, or elegant to code it in, in that way. So let's go over what each of these loops tends to be used for most often. So in a for loop, we generally already know how many times we want to iterate. That's what we put um, in the condition. For i equals zero, I, int i equals zero, i less than 10, for example, we already know that we want to do something 10 times. Um, now for a while loop, um, generally, we don't necessarily know how many times we want the loop to run, but we do know some sort of condition that we want it to, um, to always be true or always be false. For example, um, while is set, let's say that's a Boolean variable, while that's true, we want the code to evaluate. So a little bit more um, extensible, a little bit more general than a for loop, but any for loop can also be converted to a while loop. Finally, do while loops, which may be the trickiest to, to comprehend right away, are often used when we want to evaluate the code first before the first time we check the condition. So a common pattern, a uh, common use case for a do while loop is when you want to get user input. And you know you want to ask the user for input at least once. But if they don't give you good input right away, you want to keep asking them until they give you the good input. Um, so that's most common use of a do while loop. <coughs> and let's look at the actual structure of these loops. Um, they typically always tend to follow these patterns. For uh, on the for loop, Inside, we have three um, components. Initialization, typically something like int i equals zero, where i is the counter. Condition, where we want to say, run this for loop as long as this condition still holds, like i less than 10. And then finally, update, which is how we increment the counter variable at each point in the loop. So a common thing to see there is just i plus plus, which means increment i by one every time. You could also do something like i plus equals two, which means um, add two to i each time we go through the loop. And then the do this just refers to any code that actually runs as part of the loop. And for a while loop, um, this time we actually have um, the initialization outside of the loop. So for example, let's say we're trying to do the same type of loop as I just described. We would say int i equals 0 before the loop begins. Then we could say while i is less than 10, do this, so the same block of code as before. And this time, the update part of the code, for example, i++, actually goes inside of the loop. And finally, for a do while, um, it's similar to the while loop, but we just have to remember that the code will evaluate once before the, before the condition is checked. <coughs> so it, it's very, it makes a lot more sense if you look at it just um, kind of in order top to bottom. So in a do while loop, um, the code evaluates before you even look at the while condition. Um, whereas a while loop, it checks first. All right, so statements and variables. Um, so um, when we want to create a new variable, we first want to um, initialize it. 
For example, int bar initializes a variable uh, bar, but it doesn't yet give it a value. So what is bar's value now? Um, we don't know. It could be some garbage value that was um, previously stored in memory there. And we don't want to use that variable until we actually give it a value. Um, until we, um, so, so, so we declare it here, then we initialize it to be 42 <coughs> below. Now, of course, we know this can be done on one line. Int bar equals 42. But just to be clear, the multiple steps that are going on, um, the declaration and the initialization are happening separately here. Um, it happens on one step. And the next one, int baz equals bar plus one. Um, this statement below then increments baz. So at the end of this code block, um, we would, if, if we were to print the value of baz, it would be 44. Because we initialize it, we declare it and initialize it to be one greater than bar, and then we increment it once more with the plus plus. All right, so we went over this pretty briefly, um, but it's good to just have a general understanding of what threads and events are. We mainly did this in Scratch. So you can think of threads as multiple um, sequences of code running at the same time. Um, in actuality, it probably isn't running at the, at the same time, but um, sort of abstractly, we can think of it in that way. In, in Scratch, for example, we had the multiple sprites um, could be executing different code at the same time. One could be walking while the other is, is you know, saying something in a different part of the screen. Um, events are another way of running um, kind of multiple, um, sort of separating out the logic between different elements of your code. And in Scratch, we were able to simulate events using the broadcast, and I think that's actually when I receive, not when I hear. But um, essentially, it's a way to <coughs> transmit information from one sprite to another. Um, for example, you may want to transmit um, game over. And then when another sprite receives game over, it responds in a certain way. Um, so it's an important model to understand for programming. All right, just to go over kind of the basic week zero, what we've gone over so far, let's look at this simple C program. Um, it's a, the text may be a little bit small from here, but I'll just go over it really quick. We're including two um, header files at the top, cs50.h and standardio.h. We're then defining a constant called limit to be 100. Um, we're then implementing our main function. Since we don't use command line arguments here, we just need to put void as um, the, um, the arguments for main. We see int above main, that's the return type, um, hence return zero at the bottom. And we're using CS50 <coughs> library functions get int um, to ask the user for input. And we store it in this variable x. So we declare x above and we initialize it with x equals get int. Um, we then check to see if the user gave us good input. If it's greater than or equal to limit, we want to return an error code of one and print an error message. And finally, um, if the user has given us good input, we're going to square the number um, and print out that result. Um, so just to make sure that those all hit home, um, you can see the um, kind of <laughs> labels of different parts of the code here. So I mentioned constant, header files, oh, int x, make sure to remember that's a local variable. So that contrasts it from a global variable, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the review session. Um, and we are calling the library function printf. So if we hadn't included the standard io.h header file, we would not be able to call printf. Um, and I believe the arrow that got cut off here is just pointing to the percent %d, which is a formatting, a formatting string in printf. So it says, um, print out this variable as a number, percent %d. All right, and that is it for week zero. Cool, so now Lucas yeah. is going to continue. So hey guys, my name is Lucas. I'm a sophomore in the best house on campus, Mather, and I'm talk gonna talk a little bit about week one and 2.1. So as Lexi was saying, when we started like translating our code from scratch to C, one of the things that we noticed is that not any, like you cannot just write your code and run it using a green flag anymore. Actually, you have to use some steps to make your C program become executable file. So basically what you do when you're writing a program is that you translate your ideas into a language that a compiler can understand. So when you're l like uh, writing a program in C, what you're doing is actually writing something that your compiler is going to understand, and then the compiler is going to translate some, uh, that code into something that your computer will understand. And the thing is that your computer is actually very dumb. Your computer can only understand zeros and ones. So actually, in the first computers, 
People used to programming uh, like just using zeros and ones, but not anymore. Thank God we don't have to like memorize the sequences for zero and ones for a for loop or for a, for a while loop and so on. So that's why we have a compiler. Uh, what the compiler does is it basically translates the C code, in our case, to a language that your, <coughs> that your computer will understand, which is the object code. And the compiler that we're using is called Clang. So this is actually the symbol for Clang. So when you, when you have your program, you have to do two things. First, you have to compile your program, and then you're going to run your program. So to compile your program, you actually have uh, a lot of options to do so. The first one is to just do clang program.c, in which program is the name of your program. So in this case, you can see they're just saying, hey, compile my program. You're not saying, uh, I want this name for my program or anything. Uh, the second option is giving a name to your program. So you can say clang-o, and then the name that you want the executable file to be named as, and then program.c. And you can also do make program. And see how in the first two cases, I put .c, and the third one, I only have program. Yeah, you actually should not put .c when you use make. Otherwise, you're, the compiler is actually going to yell at you. And also, <coughs> I don't know if you guys remember, but a lot of times we also used a dash lcs50 or dash lm. That is, just, uh, that is called linking. It just tells the compiler that you will use those libraries right there. So if you want to use cs50.h, you actually have to type like clang program.c dash lcs50. If you don't do that, the, the compiler is not going to know that you're using those functions in cs50.h. Um, and when you want to run your program, you have two options. So if you did clang program.c, you didn't give a name to your program, you have to run it using dot slash a dot out. A dot out is just like a standard name that Clang gives to your program if you don't give it a name. Otherwise, you're just going to do a dash slash program if you gave a name to your program. And also, if you did make program, the, the name that the program is going to get is already going to be program, the, name, the same name as the, as the uh, C file. So then we talked about data types, and data uh, basically Data, uh, data types is the same thing as like little boxes that you use to store values. So data types are actually just like Pokemons. They come in all sizes and types. So <laughs> don't know if that analogy makes sense, but yeah. So the data size actually depends on the machine architecture. All the data sizes that I'm going to show here are actually for a 32-bit machine, which is the case of our appliance. But if you're actually coding your Mac or in a, like a Windows also, probably you're going to have a 64-bit machine. So just remember that the data sizes that I'm going to show here are for a 32-bit uh, machine. So the first one that we saw was an int, which is pretty straightforward. You use the int to store an integer. We also saw uh, the character, so the char. So if you want to store like a letter or a little symbol, you're probably going to use a char. A char has one byte, which means eight bits, like Lexi said. Um, so basically, we have an ASCII table that has 256 uh, possible combinations of zeros <laughs> and ones. Um, and then when you type a char, it's just going to translate the, the, the character that you input to a number that you have in the ASCII table, like Lexi said. Uh, we also have the float, which we use to uh, store decimal numbers. So if you want to store like, I don't know, 3.14, for example, you're going to use a float. Or a double that has more precision. So a float has eight, uh, four bytes, a double has eight bytes. So that the only difference is the precision. We also have a long that is used for integers. And you can see that for a 32-bit machine, an int and a long have the same size. <coughs> so like, it doesn't really make sense to use a long in a 32-bit machine. But if you're using a Mac in a 64-bit machine, actually a long has size 8. So uh, it really depends on the architecture. For the 32-bit machine, it doesn't make sense to use a long, really. And then a long long, on the other hand, has 8 bytes. So it is very good if you want to have uh, a longer uh, integer. And finally, we have a string, which is actually a char star, which is a pointer to a char. So um, it's very easy to think that like, the size of a string is going to be like the number of characters that you have there. But actually, the, the, the char star <coughs> itself has the size of a pointer to a char, which is four bytes. So the size of a char star is four bytes. Even uh, It doesn't matter if you have like a, a small word or a letter or anything, it's going to be four bytes. 
We also learned a little bit about casting. So um, as you can see, if you have, for example, a program that says int x equals 3, and then print f percent d x over 2, do you guys know what it's going to print on the screen? Someone? One, yeah, one. So when you when you do three over two, it's gonna get one point five. But since we're using an integer, it's gonna just ignore all the decimal part and you're just gonna have one. So if you don't want that to happen, what you can do, for example, is um, declare a float y equals x. So then x, uh, so then x that used to be three is now gonna be like three point zero 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 in y, and then you can print the uh, y over 2, so it's going to be actually, I should have a, a two, po two dot over there. So you're going to, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do 3.00 <coughs> .00 over 2.00, and you're going to get 1.5. 1, 1 and uh, we have this dot 2f just to, just to ask for two decimal units in the decimal part. So if you have 0.3f, it's going to have, like, it's going to have actually 1.500. If it's 2, it's going to be 1.50. Uh, we also have this case here. So if you do um, float x equals 3.14, and then you print <coughs> fx, you're going to get 3.14. And then if you do x equals the, inter the end of x, which means treat as x as an, an int, uh, and you print x now, you can actually have 3.00. Does that make sense? Because you're first treating x as an integer, so you're just ignoring all the decimal part, and then you're printing x. And finally, you can also do this. So like int x equals 65, and then you declare a, a char c equals x. And then if you print the, the c, you're actually going to get the cap letter capital A. So basically what you're doing here is translating the integer into the character, just like the ASCII table does. We also talked about math operators. Most of them are pretty straightforward. So like sum, subtraction, times, and like division. And also we talked about mod, which is just like the remainder of a division of two numbers. So if you have like 10 mod, mod 3, for example, it just means like divide 10 by 3, and what is the remainder? It's going to be 1. So it's actually very useful for a lot of the programs. For visionary uh, Caesar, I'm pretty sure that all of you guys used mod, right? Um, about math operators, be very careful when combining uh, times and division. For example, if you do 3 over 2 times 2, what are you going to get? Yeah, 2. Because you're going to do 3 over 2 is going to be 1.5. But since you're doing <coughs> operations between two integers, you're actually just going to consider 1. And then 1 times 2 is going to be 2. So be very, very careful when doing uh, arithmetic with integers, because you might get like that 2 equals 3 in that case. Uh, and also be very careful about precedence. You should usually uh, use parentheses just to be sure that you know what you're doing. <coughs> Uh, so musical shortcuts, the first one is um, I plus plus or I plus equals one or just like using plus equals. That is the same thing as doing I equals I plus one. You can also do I minus minus or I minus equals one, which is the same thing as I equals I minus one. That's something you guys use a lot in for loops at least. Also for times. Uh, if you use times equals, and if you do, for example, i times equals 2 is the same thing as saying i equals i times 2. And the same thing for division. So if you do i uh, over, two, over equals 2 is the same thing as i equals i over 2. So now about functions. So you guys learned that functions are a very good strategy to save code while you're programming. So if you <coughs> want to perform the same task in code again and again, probably once you use a, a function, just so you don't have to uh, copy and paste the code, the code over and over again. So actually, main is a function. And when I show you the format of a function, you're going to see that that is actually pretty obvious. Uh, we also use functions from some libraries. For example, printf, uh, getint, which is from the CSVP library, and other functions like toupper. So all of those functions are actually implemented in other libraries. And when you put those header files in the beginning of your program, you're just saying, can you please like, give me the code for those functions so I don't have to implement them by myself? 
Um, and you can also write your own functions. So when you start programming, you'll actually realize that libraries don't have all the functions that you need. So for the last piece set, for example, you, we, we wrote draw, scramble, and lookup. And it's actually very, very important to be able to write <coughs> functions because they're useful and we use them all the time when programming. And it saves a lot of code. So the format of a function is this one. We have a return type in the beginning. So what is the return type? It's just what your function is going to return. So if you have a function, for example, factorial, that is going to calculate the factorial of an integer, probably it's going to return an integer also. So then the return type is going to be int. Uh, printf actually has a uh, ret uh, return type void because you're not returning anything. You're just printing things to the, to the screen and just quitting the function afterwards. Uh, then you have the name of the function that you can choose. You should like just be a little reasonable. Like don't choose a name like XYZ or like, I don't know, X2F. I don't know, like try to make, make up a name that makes sense. Uh, like for example, if it's factorial, say factorial. If it's a function that is going to draw something, name it draw. Uh, and then we have the parameters, which are also called arguments, which are like the resources that your function need from your code to perform its task. So if you want to calculate the factorial of a number, probably you need to have a number to calculate the factorial. So one of the arguments that you're going to have is the, the number itself. And then it's going to do something and return uh, the value at the end unless it's a void function. <coughs> so let's see an example. So if I want to write a function that sums all the numbers in an array of integers, first of all, I'm gonna, the return type is going to be int, right? Because I have a, an array of integers. And then I'm going to have the function name it like sum array. And then it's going to take the array itself, so int nums, and then the length of the array, so I know how many numbers I have to sum. Then I have to initialize a variable called sum, for example, to 0. And every time I, uh, I see an element in the array, I should add it to sum. So I did a for loop, just like Lexi said. You just do int i equals 0, i less than the length, and i plus plus. And for every, uh, every element in the array, I did sum plus equals nums i. And then I returned the sum. So it's very simple, and it saves a lot of code if you're using this function a lot of times. Um, then we took a look, uh, look at conditions. So we here have if, <coughs> else, and else if. So, so let's see what is the difference between those. So take a look at these two codes. What is the difference between them? The first one has uh, if, so basically the codes want you to tell if a number is positive, negative, or zero. So the first one says if it's more than zero, then it's positive. If it's equal to zero, then it's zero. And if it's less than zero, then it's negative. And the, the other one's doing if, else, if, else. The difference between the two is that this one is actually going to check if x is greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero, like three times. So if you have the number two, for example, it's going to come here and say, is x greater than 0? And it's going to say yes, so I print positive. But even though I know that it's greater than 0 and it's not going to be 0 or less than 0, I'm still going to do, is it 0? Is it less than 0? So I'm actually perf like going inside of ifs that I actually didn't have to because I already know that it's not going to satisfy any of these conditions. So I can use the if, else, if, else statement. So it basically says, if x equals 0, I print the positive. If it's not, I'm going to also to test this. If it's 2 not, I'm going to do this. So basically, if I had x equals 2, it would say, is x greater than 0? Yes, yeah, so print this. So now that I know that it's greater than 0 and that it satisfied the first if, I'm not going to even run this code. So the code just <coughs> runs faster, actually three times faster if you use this. So we also learned about and and or. I'm not going like, to go through this because Lexi already talked about them. So it's just the and and or operator. The only thing I would say is be careful when you have like three conditions, like use parentheses, because it's very confusing when you have like a condition and another one or another one. So use parentheses just to be sure that your conditions make sense. Because in that case, for example, you can imagine that, for example, it could be like the first condition and one or the other, or like the two conditions combined in an end, or the third one. So <coughs> just be careful. And finally, we talked about switches. So a switch is just very useful when you have like a variable. 
let's say that you have a variable like n that can be like 0, 1, or 2. And for like each of those cases, you're going to perform a task. So you can say like switch the variable n. And in the case that the value of n is, one, is like value 1, I'm going to do this. And then I break, which just means that like I'm not going to look at any of the other cases because it already sets, satisfied that case. And then value 2 and so on. And I also can have a default uh, switch that just means if it doesn't satisfy any of the cases that I had, then I'm going to do something else. But that's optional. So that's all for me. So now let's have tell me. All right. So this is going to be week three-ish. Uh, so these are some of the topics we'll be covering. Um, so crypto, scope, arrays, etc. So just a quick word on crypto. We're not going to hammer this home since uh, we did this in PSET 2. But just for the quiz, make sure you know the difference between the Caesar cipher, the Legionnaire cipher, how both of those ciphers work, and what it's like to encrypt and decrypt text using those two ciphers. So remember, the Caesar cipher simply rotates each character by the same amount making sure you mod by the number of letters in the alphabet. Uh, and the Visionaire cipher, on the other hand, rotates each character by a different amount. By, so rather than saying you know, every character rotated by three, Visionaire will rotate each character by a different amount, depending on some keyword, where each letter in the keyword <coughs> represents some different amount to rotate the clear text by. So uh, whoa. let's first talk about variable scope. So there are two different types of variables. We have global variables. And these are going to be defined outside of main or outside any function or block. And these will be accessible anywhere in your program. So if you have a function and then that function is a while loop, the global variable is accessible everywhere. A local variable, on the other hand, is scoped to the place where it is defined. So if you have a function here, for example, we have this function g. And inside of g, there's a variable here called y. And that means that this is a local variable. So even though this variable is called y and this variable is called y, these two functions have no idea what each other's local variables are. On the other hand, up here, we say int x equals 5. And this is outside the scope of any function. It's outside the scope of main. So this is a global variable. So that means that inside of these two functions, when I say x minus minus or x plus plus, I'm accessing the same x, whereby this y and this y are different variables. So that's the difference between a global variable and a local variable. As far as design is concerned, uh, sometimes it's probably a better idea to keep variables local whenever you possibly can, since having a bunch of global variables can get really confusing. If you have a bunch of functions all modifying the same thing, you might forget, you know, what if this function accidentally modifies this global and this other function doesn't know about it? And they just get pretty confusing as you get more code. So keeping, keeping variables local whenever you possibly can is just good design. So arrays, remember, are simply lists of elements of the same type. Inside of C, I can't have a list like 1, 2.0, hello. We just can't do that. When we declare an array in C, all of the elements have to be of the same type. So here I have an array of three integers. So here I have the length of the array. But if I'm just declaring it in this syntax where I specify what all the elements are, I don't technically need this three. The compiler is smart enough to figure out how big the array should be. So now when I want to get or set the value of an array, this is the syntax to do that. So this will actually modify the second element of the array, because remember, numbering starts at 0, not at 1. So if I just want to read that value, I can just say something like int x <coughs> equals array bracket 1. Or if I want to set that value, like I'm doing here, I can say array bracket 1 equals 4. So that's how I'm accessing elements by their index, or their position, or where they are in the array. And that listing starts at 0. So we can also have arrays of arrays. And this is called a multi-dimensional array. So when we have a multi-dimensional array, that means we can have something like rows and columns. And this is just one way of visualizing this or thinking about it. So when I have a multi-dimensional array, that means I'm going to start needing more than one index. right? Because if we have a grid, just saying what row you're in doesn't give us a number. That's really just going to give us a list of numbers. So let's say I have this array here. So I have an array called grid. And I'm saying it's two rows and three columns. And so this is one way of visualizing it. So when I say I want to get the element at bracket 1, bracket 2, that means that because these are rows first and then columns, I'm going to jump <coughs> to row 1, since I said 1. Then I come over here to column 2, and I'm going to get the value 6. Make sense? 
So multidimensional arrays, remember, is technically just an array of arrays. We can have arrays of arrays of arrays. We can keep going. Um, but really, one way to think about how this is being laid out and what's going on is to visualize it in a grid like this. So when we pass arrays to functions, they're going to behave a little bit differently than when we pass regular variables to functions, like passing an int or a float. So when we pass in an int, a char, or any of these other data types we just took a look at, if the function modifies the value of that variable, that change is not going to propagate up to the function that, to the calling function. <coughs> With an array, on the other hand, that will happen. So if I pass in an array to some function, and that function changes some of the elements, when I come back up to the function that called it, my array is now going to be different. And the vocabulary for that is arrays are passed by reference. As we'll see later, this is related to how pointers work, um, where these basic data types, on the other hand, are passed by value. So we can think of that as making a copy of some variable and then passing in the copy. So it doesn't matter what we do to that variable. The calling function will not be aware that it was changed. So arrays are just a little bit different in that regard. So for example, as we just saw, main is simply a function that can take in two arguments. So the first argument to the main function is argc, or the number of arguments. And the second argument is called argv, <coughs> and those are the actual values of those arguments. So let's say I have a program called this.c, and I say make this, and then I'm going to run this at the command line. So now to pass in some arguments to my program called this, I could say something like dot slash this is CS50. This is what we imagine David to do every day at the terminal. But now the main function inside of that program has these values. So argc is 4. So it might be a little confusing, because really we're only passing in is cs50. That's only 3. But remember that the first element of argv, or the first argument, is the name of the function itself. So that means that we have four things here. And the first element is going to be dot slash this. And this will be represented as a string. And then the remaining elements are what we typed <coughs> in after the name of the program. So just as an aside, uh, as we probably saw in pset 2, remember that the string 50 is not going to be equal to the integer 50. So we can't say something like int x equals argv3. That's just not going to make sense, because this is a string and this is an integer. So if we want to convert between the two, remember, we're going to have this magic function called a2i that takes a string and returns the integer represented inside of that string. So that's an easy mistake. Uh, to make on the quiz, just thinking that you know, this will automatically be the correct type. Um, but just know that these will always be strings, even if the string only contains an integer or a character or a float. So now let's talk about running time. So when we have all these algorithms that do all these crazy things, it becomes really useful to ask the question, how long do they take? And so we represent that with something called asymptotic notation. So this means that, well, let's say we give our algorithm some really, really, really big input. We want to ask the question, how long is it going to take? How many steps will it take our algorithm to run as a function of the size of the input? So the first way we can describe runtime is with big O. And this is our worst case running time. So if we want to sort an array and we give our algorithm an array that's in descending order when it should be in ascending order, that's going to be the worst case. And so this is kind of our upper bound and how the maximum length of time our algorithm will take. So on the other hand, this omega is going to describe best case running time. So if we give an already sorted array to a sorting algorithm, how long will it take to sort it? And this <coughs> effectively then describes a lower bound on runtime. So here are just some words uh, that describe some common running times. And so these are in ascending order. So the fastest running time we can have is called constant. So that means no matter how many elements uh, we give our algorithm, no matter how big our array is, sorting it or doing whatever we're doing to the array will always take the same amount of time. So we can represent that just with a 1, which is a constant. So we also looked at logarithmic runtime. So something like binary search is logarithmic, where we cut the problem in half every time. And then uh, things just kind of get higher from there. If you're ever writing an O of n factorial algorithm, uh, you probably shouldn't consider this as your day job. <coughs> so when we compare running times, 
it's, it's important uh, to keep in mind these things. So if I have an algorithm that's O, and N, of, that's o of n, and someone else has an algorithm that's O of 2n, these are actually asymptotically equivalent. So if we imagine n to be a big number like 11 d billion, so when we're comparing 11 d billion to something like 11 d billion plus 3, suddenly that plus 3 doesn't really make a big difference anymore. So that's why we're going to start considering these things to be equivalent. So things like these constants here, there's 2 times this or adding a 3, these are just constants and these are going to drop up. So that's why all three of these runtimes are the same as saying they're O of n. Similarly, if we have two other runtimes, let's say n cubed plus 2n squared, we can add you know, plus n plus 7. And then we have another runtime that's just O of n cubed. Again, these are the same thing. Because these, uh, these are not the same. These are the same things. <laughs> so these are the same because this n cubed is going to dominate this 2n squared. What is not the same thing? is if we have runtimes like O of n cubed and O of n squared. Because this n cubed is much larger than this n squared. So when we have an exponent, suddenly this starts to matter. But when we're just dealing with factors, as we are up here, then it's not going to matter, because they're just going to drop up. So let's take a look at some of the algorithms we've seen so far and talk about their runtime. So the first way of looking for a number in a list that we saw was linear search. And the implementation of linear search is super straightforward. We just have a list, and we're <coughs> going to look at every single element in the list until we find the number we're looking for. So that means that in the worst case, this is big O of n. And the worst case here could be, well, if the element is the last element, then using linear search, we have to look at every single element until we get to the last one in order to know that it was actually in the list. Right? We can't just give up halfway and say, yeah, it's probably not there. With linear search, we have to look at the whole thing. The best case running time, on the other hand, is constant. Because in the best case, well, the element we're looking for is just the first one in the list. And so it's going to take us exactly one step, no matter how big the list is, if we're looking for the first element every time. So linear search, remember, does not require that our list be sorted, because we're <coughs> simply going to look over every single element, and it doesn't really matter what order those elements are in. So a more intelligent search algorithm is something like binary search. So remember, the implementation of binary search is when you're going to keep looking at the middle of the list. And because we're looking at the middle, we require that the list is sorted, or else we don't know where the middle is, and we have to look over the whole list to find it. And then at that point, we're just wasting time. So if we have a sorted list and we find the middle, we're going to compare the middle to the element we're looking for. And so if it's too high, then we can forget the right half, because we know that if our element is already too high, and everything to the right of this element is even higher, then we don't need to look there anymore. Or on the other hand, if our element is too low, we know everything to the left of that element is also too low, so it doesn't really make sense to look there either. And so in this way, with every step and every time we look at the midpoint of the list, we're going to cut our problem in half. Because suddenly we know a whole bunch of numbers that can't be the one we're looking for. So in pseudocode, this would look something um, like this. And because we're cutting the list in half every single time, our worst case runtime jumps from linear to logarithmic. So suddenly we have log n steps in order to find an element in a list. The best case running time, though, is still constant. Because now, let's just say that the element we're looking for is always the exact middle of the original list. So we can grow our list as big as we want. But if the element we're looking for is at the middle, then it's only going to take us one step. So that's why we're big O of log n and omega of 1, or constant. So uh, let's actually run binary search on this list. So let's say that we're looking for the element 164. So the first thing we're going to do is find the midpoint of this list. It just so happens that the midpoint is going to fall in between these two numbers. So let's just arbitrarily say every time the midpoint falls in between two numbers, let's just round up. So we just need to make sure we do this uh, at every step of the way. So we're going to round up, and we're going to say that 161 is the middle of our <coughs> list. So 161 is less than 164. And every element to the left of 161 is also less than 164. So we know that it's not going to help us at all to start looking over here, because the element we're looking for can't be there. So what we can do is we can actually just forget about that whole left half of the list, and now only consider 
from the right of the 161 onward. So again, this is the midpoint. Let's just round up. Now, 175 is too big. So we know it's not going to help us looking here or here. So we can just throw that away. And eventually, we'll hit the 164. Any questions on binary search? OK, so let's move on from searching through an already sorted list to actually taking a list of numbers in any order and making that list in ascending order. So the first algorithm we looked at was called bubble sort. And this was the simpler of the algorithms we saw. And so bubble sort says that when any two elements inside of a list are out of place, meaning there's a higher number to the left of a lower number, then we're going to swap them. Because that means that the list will be more sorted than it was before. And we're just going to continue this process again and again and again until eventually the elements kind of bubble to their correct locations and we have a sorted list. So the runtime of this is going to be big O of n squared. Why? Well, because in the worst case, we're going to take every element and we're going to end up comparing it to really every other element in the list. But in the best case, we have an already sorted list. Bubble sort's just going to go through once, say, nope, I didn't make any swaps, so I'm done. So we have a best case running time of omega n. So let's run bubble sort on a list. Or first, let's just look at some pseudocode really quickly. Um, so we want to say we want to keep track of, in every iteration of the loop, keep track of whether or not we changed any elements. So the reason for that is we're going to <coughs> stop when we have not swapped any elements. So at the start of our loop, we haven't swapped anything. So we'll say that's false. And so now. We're going to go through the list and compare element i to element i plus 1. And if it is the case that there's a big number to the left of a smaller number, then we're just going to swap them. And then we're going to remember that we swapped an element. And that means that we need to go through the list at least one more time. Because the condition in which we stop is when the whole list is already sorted, meaning we have not made any swaps. So that's why our condition down here is while some elements have been swapped. So now let's just look at this running on a list. So I'll have the list 50164. So bubble sort is going to start all the way at the left. And it's going to compare the i element, so 0, to i plus 1, which is element 1. And it's going to say, well, 5 is more than 0, but right now 5 is to the left. So I need to swap the 5 and the 0. So when I swap them, suddenly I get this different list. And so now 5 is less than 1, so we're going to swap them. 5 is not less than 6. So we don't need to do anything here. But 6 is greater than 4, so we need to swap. Again, we need to run through the whole list to eventually discover that these are out of order. We swap them. And so now, at this point, we need to run through the list one more time to make sure that everything is in its order. And then at this point, bubble sort has finished. So a different algorithm for taking some elements and sorting them is selection sort. So the idea behind selection sort is that we're going to kind of build up a sorted portion of the list, one element at a time. And the way we're going to do that is by building up the left segment of the list. And basically, every on each step, we're going to take the smallest element we have left that hasn't been sorted yet, and we're going to move it into that sorted segment. So that means we need to continuously find the minimum unsorted element, and then take that minimum element and swap it with whatever leftmost element that is not sorted is. So <coughs> the runtime of this is going to be big O of n squared. Because in the worst case, we need to compare every single element to every other element. right? Because we're saying that if we start at the left half of the list, we need to go through the entire right segment to find the smallest element. And then again, we need to go over the entire right segment and keep going over that over and over and over again. So that's going to be n squared. We're going to need a for loop inside of another for loop, which suggests n squared. In the best case, though, let's, let's say we give it an already sorted list. We actually don't do any better than n squared. Because selection sort has no way of knowing that, well, the minimum element is just the one I happen to be looking at. It still needs to make sure that this is actually the minimum. And the only way to make sure that it's the minimum using this algorithm is to look at every single element again. So really, if you, give it, if you give selection sort an already sorted list, it's really not going to do any better than giving it a list that isn't sorted yet. So by the way, if it happens to be the case that something is big O of something and omega of something, 
we can just say more succinctly that it's theta of something. So if you see that come up anywhere, that's what that just means. So if something's theta of n squared, it is both big O of n squared and omega of n squared. So best case and worst case, doesn't make a difference. The algorithm is going to do the same thing every time. So this is what pseudocode for selection sort could look like. We're basically going to say that I want to iterate over the list from left to right. And at each iteration of the loop, I'm going to move the minimum element into this sorted portion of the list. And once I move something there, I never need to look at that element again. Because as soon as I swap an element into the left segment of the list, it's sorted. Because we're doing everything in ascending order by using minimums. So we say that, OK, if we're at position i, then we need to look at all of the, uh, all of the elements to the right of i in order to find the minimum. So that means we want to look from i plus 1 to the end of the list. And now, if the element that we're currently looking at is less than our minimum so far, which remember, we're starting the minimum off to just be whatever element I'm currently at. I'll assume that's the minimum. If I find an element that's smaller than that, then I'm going to say, OK, well, I have found a new minimum. And I'm going to remember where that minimum was. So now, once I've gone through that right unsorted segment, I can say I'm going to swap the minimum element with the element that is in position i. And so that's going to build up my list, my sorted portion of the list from left to right. And we don't ever need to look at an element again once it's in that portion, so once we've swapped it. So let's run selection sort on this list. So the blue element here is going to be the i. And the red element is going to be the minimum element. So i starts all the way at the left of the list, so at 5. And so now we need to find the minimum unsorted element. So we say, OK, well, 0 is less than 5. So 0 is my new minimum. But I can't stop there, because even though we can recognize that, well, 0 is the smallest, we need to actually run through every other element of the list to make sure. So 1 is bigger, 6 is bigger, 4 is bigger. So that means that after looking at all of these elements, I've determined 0 is the smallest. So I'm going to swap the 5 and the 0. So once I swap that, I'm going to get a new list. And I know that I never need to look at that 0 again. Because once I've swapped it, I've sorted it, and we're done. So now it just so happens that the blue element is again the 5. And we need to look at the 1, the 6, and the 4 to determine that 1 is the smallest minimum element. So we'll swap the 1 and the 5. Again, we need to look at compare the 5 to the 6 and the 4. Then we're going to swap the 4 and the 5. And finally, compare those two numbers and swap them until we get our sorted list. Any questions on selection sort? OK. So uh, let's move to the last topic here, and that is recursion. So recursion, remember, is this really meta thing uh, where a function repeatedly calls itself. So at some point, while our function is repeatedly calling itself, there needs to be some point at which we stop calling ourselves. Because if we don't do that, then we're just going to continue to do this forever, and our program is just not going to terminate. So we call this condition the base case. And the base case says, well, rather than calling the function again, I'm just going to return some value. And so once we've returned a value, we've kind of stopped calling ourselves. And the rest of the calls we've made so far can also return. So the opposite of the base case is the recursive case. And this is when we want to make another call to the function that we're currently in. And we probably, although not always necessarily, we probably want to use different arguments, right? Because if we have a function called f, and f just call, takes one argument, and we just keep calling f of 1, f of 1, f of 1, and it just so happens that the argument 1 falls into the recursive case, we're still never going to stop. So even if we have a base case, we need to make sure that eventually we're going to hit that base case. We don't just keep staying in this recursive case. So generally, when we call ourselves, we're probably going to have a different argument each time. <coughs> and so here is a really simple recursive <coughs> function. So this will compute the factorial of a number. And so up top here, we have our base case. So in the case that n is less than or equal to 1, we're not going to call factorial again. We're going to stop, and we're just going to return some value. So if this is not true, then we're going to hit our recursive case. So notice here that we're not just calling factorial of n, because that wouldn't be very helpful. We're going to call factorial of something else. And so you can see, eventually, if we pass you know, factorial of 5 or something, we're going to call factorial 4 and so on. And eventually, we're going to hit this base case. So this looks good. 
So let's see what happens when we actually run this. So this is the stack. And let's say that main is going to call this function with an argument of 4. So once factorial sees n equals 4, factorial will call itself. Now suddenly we have factorial of 3. And so these functions are going to keep growing until eventually we hit our base case. And so at this point, the return value of this is the return value of, is n times the return value of this. The return value of this is n times the return value of this. So eventually, we need to hit some number. So at the top here, we say return 1. So that means that once we return that number, we can pop this off the stack. So this factorial of 1 is done. So when 1 returns, this factorial of 1 returns, this returned a 1. And the return value of this, remember, was n times the return value of this. So suddenly, this guy knows that I want to return 2. So remember, the return value of this is just n times the return value up here. So suddenly, we can say, well, now we can say 3 times 2. And finally, here, we can say, well, this is just going to be 4 times 3 times 2. And once this returns, we get down to a single integer inside of main. So any questions on recursion? All right, so more time for questions at the end. Uh, but now Joseph will cover the remaining topics. All right, so now that we've talked about recursion, let's talk a little bit about what merge sort is. And merge sort is basically another way of sorting a list of numbers. And how it works is, well, with merge sort, we have a list. And what we do is we say, <coughs> let's split this list into two halves. So we'll first run merge sort again on the left half. Then we'll run merge sort in the right half. And that gives us now two halves that are sorted. And now we're going to combine those halves together. It's a bit hard to, to see without an example. So we'll go through the motions and see what happens. All right. So we start with this list. We split it into two halves. So we run merge sort on the left half first. So that's the left half. And then now we run into this list again, which gets passed into merge sort. And then we look again at the left side of this list, and we run merge sort on it. Now we get down to a list of two numbers. And now the left half is only one element long. And we can't split a list that's only one element into halves. So we just say once we have 50, which is just one element, it's already sorted. And now, once we're done with that, we can see that we can move on to the right half of this list. And 3 is also sorted. And so now that both halves of this list are sorted, we can join these numbers back together. So we look at 50 and 3. 3 is smaller than 50, so it goes in first. And then 50 comes in. Now that's done. We go back up to that list and sort it, right half. 42 is its own number, so it's already sorted. And so now we compare these two lists. And 3 is smaller than 42, so that gets put in first. Now 42 gets put in, and 50 gets put in. Now that's sorted. We go back all the way up to the top, 13, 37, and 15. Well, we now look at the left half of this list, 13, 37. Is by itself, so it's sorted, and same with 15. So now we combine these two numbers to sort that original list. 15 is smaller than 1337, so it goes in first. Then 1337 goes in. And now we've sorted both halves of that original list up top. And all we have to do is combine these. So we look at the first two numbers of this list. 3 is smaller than 15, so it goes into the sorted array first. 15 is smaller than 42, so it goes in. Now, 42 is smaller <coughs> than 1337. That goes in. 50 is smaller than 1337. So it goes in. And notice that we just took two numbers off of this list. So we're not just alternating between the two lists. We're just looking at the beginning, and we're taking the element that's smaller and then putting it into our array. And now we've merged all the halves, and we're done. OK, cool. Any questions about merge list? Yes? Uh, so the reason, so the question is, why can't we just merge them at that first step after we've had them? Well, the reason we can do this sort of, let's start at the leftmost element of both sides, and then take the smaller one and put it in, is that we know that these individual lists are in sorted order, right? So if I'm looking at the leftmost elements of both halves, I know they're going to be the smallest elements of those lists. So I can put them into the smallest element spot of this large list. On the other hand, if I look at those two lists, 
on the second level over there. 50, 3, 42, 13, 37, and 15, those aren't sorted. So if I look at 50 and 13, 37, I'm going to put 50 into my list first. But that doesn't really make sense because 3 is the smallest element out of all of those, right? So the only reason we can do this combining step is because our lists are already sorted, which is why we have to get down all the way to the bottom because when we have just a single number, we know that a single number in and of itself is already a sorted list. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, moving on. So complexity, well, you can see that at each step, there's sort of n numbers, and we can divide a list in half log n times, which is where we sort of get this n times log n complexity. And you'll see that the best case for merge sort is n log n, and it just so happens that the worst case, or the omega over there, is also n log n. Something to keep in mind. Okay. So moving on, let's go on to some super basic file IO. So if you looked at Scramble, you notice we had some sort of system where you could write to a log file if you read through the code. And let's see how you might do that. Well, we have fprintf, which you can think of as just printf, but printing to a file instead, and hence the f at the beginning. So this sort of code up here, what it does is, as you might have seen in Scramble, it goes through your two-dimensional array, printing out row by row what the numbers are. And so in this case, printf prints out to your terminal, or what we call the standard output uh, section. And now in this case, all we have to do is replace printf with fprintf, tell it what file we want to print to, and in this case, it just prints it out to that file instead of printing it out to your terminal. Okay, so, well, then that begs the question, where do we get this sort of file from, right? We pass log into this fprintf function, but we had no idea where it came from. Well, early in the code, what we had was this chunk of code over here, which basically says, let's open a file called log.txt. And then what we do after that is we have to make sure that the file is actually open successfully. So it might fail for multiple reasons if you don't have enough space on your computer, for example. So it's always important before we do any operations with the file that we check whether that file is open successfully. And so what's that A, that's an argument to F open? <coughs> well, we can open a file in many ways. What we can do is we can pass it W, which means overwrite the file if it exists already. We can pass an A, which says, append to the end of the file instead of overriding it. Or we can specify R, which means let's open this file as read only. So if the program tries to make any changes to the file, yell at them and don't let them do it. And finally, once we're done with the file, done doing operations on it, we need to make sure we close the file. And so at the end of your program, you are going to pass in again this file that you opened and just close it. So this is something important that you have to make sure you do. So remember, you can open the file, then you can write to the file, do operations in the file, but then you have to close the file at the end. Any questions on basic file I.O.? Yes? Where does uh, the log.txt file exist? So right here, the question is, where does this log.txt file appear? Well, if you just give it log.txt, it creates it as in the same directory as the executable. So if you're executing. The folder it creates. Yeah, created. in the same folder or the same directory as we call it. Okay. So now memory stack and heap. So how is memory laid out on the computer? Well, you can imagine memory as sort of this block here. And well, in memory, we have what's called the heap that's over there and the stack that's down there. And the heap grows downwards and the stack grows upwards. So as Tommy mentioned, oh, well, and we have these other four segments, which I'll get to in a second. As Tommy said earlier, you know how as functions call themselves and call each other, they build up this sort of stack frame. Well, if main calls foo, foo gets put on the stack, foo calls, foo calls bar, bar gets put on the stack, and baz gets put on the stack after. And as they return, they each get taken off the stack. So now, what do each of these locations in memory hold? Well, the top, which is the text segment, contains the program itself, so the machine code that's there once you compile your program. Next, any initialized global variables. So you have global variables in your program, and you say like int a equals 5, that gets put in that segment. And right under that, we have any uninitialized global data, which is just int a, but you don't say it's equal to anything. And realize these are global variables, so they're outside of main. So this means any global variables that are declared, but they're not initialized. So what's in the heap? Memory allocated using malloc, which we'll get to in a little bit. And then finally, with the stack, we have any local variables and any functions you might call in any of their parameters. <coughs> Last thing, you don't really have to know what these environment, uh, environment variables do, but 
whenever you run a program, there are some things associated with it, like this is the username of the person who ran the program. And that's going to be stored at the bottom. So in terms of memory addresses, which are hexadecimal values, values at the top start at zero and they go all the way down to the bottom. In this case, if we're on the 32-bit system, the address at the bottom is going to be 0x followed by 8f, because that's 32 bits, which is 8 bytes. <coughs> and in this case, 8 bytes corresponds to 8 hexadecimal digits. So down here, you're going to have like 0x, f, 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 and up there, you're going to have 0x, 0. X, zero. All right, so what are pointers? Some of you may not have covered this in section before, but we did go over it in lecture. So a pointer is just a data type which stores, instead of some sort of value like 50, it stores the address of some location in memory, like that memory layout had shown before. So in this case, what we have is we have a pointer to an integer, or an int star, and it contains this hexadecimal address 0x dead beat. Okay. And so what we have is, now this pointer points to some location in memory, and let's just say the value 50 is at this memory location. So on some 32-bit system, on all 32-bit systems, pointers take up 32 bits, or four bytes. But for example, in a 64-bit system, pointers are 64 bits. So that's something you want to keep in mind. So on an n-bit system, a pointer is n bits long. So pointers are high, like, sort of hard to digest without sort of extra things. So let's go through an example of dynamic memory allocation. So what dynamic memory allocation does for you, or what we call malloc, is it lets you allocate some sort of data outside of the stack. So this data is sort of more permanent for the duration of the program. Because as you know, if you declare like int x inside of a function and that function returns, you no longer have very uh, access to the data that was stored in x, right? So what pointers let us do is they let us store memory or store values in a different segment of memory, namely the heap. And now once we return out of the function, as long as we have a pointer to that location in memory, then what we can do is we can just look at the value there. So let's look at an example. So this is our memory layout again. And we have this function main, that what it does is, okay, so simple, right? Int x equals five, that's just a variable on the stack in main. Now on the other hand, now we declare a pointer, which calls this function give me three bits. <coughs> and so now we go into this function and we create a new stack frame for it. However, in this stack frame, we declare int star temp, which mallocs three integers for us. So size of int will give us how many bytes this int is, and malloc gives us that many bytes of space on the heap. So in this case, we have created enough space for three integers. And the heap is way up there, which is why I've drawn it higher up. Now, once we're done, we come back up here, give me three inch returns, and it returns the address, in this case, of where that memory is. And we set pointer equal to it. And up there, we have just another pointer. But once that function returns, of course, this stack frame disappears, right? So temp disappears, but we still maintain the address of where those three integers are inside of main. So in this sense, the pointers are scoped locally to the stack frame, but the memory to which they refer is in the heap. Does that make sense? OK. Can you repeat that? Yes. So if I go back just a little bit, we see that temp allocated some memory on the heap up there, right? And so when this function gives me three int returns, this stack frame is going to disappear. And with it, any of the variables, in this case, this pointer that was allocated in the stack frame. So that is going to disappear. But since we returned temp and we set pointer equal to temp, pointer is now going to point the same memory location as temp was. So now even though we lose temp, that local pointer, we still retain the memory address of what it was pointing to inside of that variable pointer. Questions? That can be kind of a confusing topic. If you haven't gone over it in section, uh, we can, your TF will definitely go over it. Um, and we can, of course, answer questions at the end of the review session for this. But this is sort of a complex topic. And I have more examples that are going to show up that will sort of help clarify what pointers actually are. OK? So in this case, pointers are equivalent <coughs> to arrays. So I can just use this pointer as the same thing as an int array. So I'm indexing into 0. I'm changing the first integer to 1, changing the second integer to 2, and the third integer to 3. OK. So more on pointers. Well, recall Binky, right? So 
in this case, we've allocated a pointer, uh, we've declared a pointer, but initially when I just declared a pointer, it's not pointing to anywhere in memory, right? It just has garbage values inside of it. So I have no idea where this pointer is pointing to. It has some address, which is just filled with zeros and ones where it was initially declared. So I can't do anything with this until I call malloc on it, and then it gives me a little space on the heap where I can put values inside. Then again, I don't know what's inside of this memory. <coughs> And so the first thing I have to first do is check whether the system had enough memory to give me back one integer in the first place, which is why I'm doing this check. So if pointer is null, that means that it didn't have enough space or some other error occurred, so I should exit out of my program. But if it did succeed, now I can use that pointer. And what star pointer does is it follows where the address is to where that value is, and it sets it equal to one. So over here, we're checking if that memory existed, and once we know it exists, we can <coughs> check and put into it what the value we want to put into it is, in this case, one. And once we're done with it, we need to free that pointer because we need to give back to the system that memory that we asked for in the first place. Because the computer doesn't know when we're done with it. And in this case, we're explicitly telling it, okay, we're done with that memory. If some other process needs it, some other program needs it, feel free to go ahead and take it. So what we can also do is we can just get the address of local variables on the stack. So in this case, int x is inside the stack frame of main, right? And when we use this and percent, uh, this and operator, what it does is it takes x, and x is just some data in memory, right? But it has an address, it's located somewhere. So by calling end x, what this does is it gives us the address of x. And so by doing this, we're making pointer point to where x is in memory. So now if we just do something like star x, we're going to get 5 back. And the star is called dereferencing it. You follow the address, and you get the value that's stored there. Any questions? Yes? If you don't do the free pointer thing, does it still compile? So yes, if you don't do the free pointer thing, it's still going to compile. But I'll show you what happens in a second. And Without doing that, that's what we call a memory leak. right? You're not giving the system back its memory. So after a while, the program's going to accumulate memory that it's not using and nothing else can use it. And if you've ever seen like Firefox at like 1.5 million kilobytes on your computer in the task manager, that's what's going on. They have a memory leak in their program that they're not handling. So how does pointer arithmetic work? Well, pointer arithmetic is sort of like indexing into an array. And so in this case, I have a pointer. And what I do is I make pointer point to the first element of this array of three integers that I've allocated. So now what I do, star pointer just changes the first element in the list. Star pointer plus one points over here. So pointer is over here, pointer plus one is over here, pointer plus two is over here. So just adding one is the same thing as moving along this array. And so what we do is when we do pointer plus one, we get the address over here. And in order to get the value in here, we put a star in front of that entire expression to dereference it. So in this case, I'm setting pointer, the first location in this array to one, second location to two, third location to three. And then what I'm doing over here is I'm printing out pointer plus one, which just gives me two. Now I'm incrementing pointer, so pointer equals pointer plus one, which moves it forward. And so now if I print out pointer plus one, pointer plus one is now three, which in this case prints out three. And in order to free something, the pointer that I give it must be pointing at the beginning of the array, which I got back from malloc. So in this case, if I were to call free right here, this wouldn't be right because it's in the middle of the array. I have to subtract to get back to original location, the initial first spot, before I can free it. All right. OK. So here's a more involved example. In this case, we're allocating seven characters in a character array. And in this case, what we're doing is we're looping over the first six of them, and we're setting them to z. So for int i equals 0, i less than 6, i plus plus. So pointer plus i will just give us, in this case, pointer, pointer plus 1, pointer plus 2, pointer plus 3, and so on and so forth in the loop. And what it's going to do is it gets that address, dereferences it to get the value, and changes that value to a z. And then at the end, remember, this is a string, right? All strings have to end with the null terminating character. So what I do is, in pointer 6, I put the null terminating character in. And now, what I'm basically doing over here is implementing printf for a string, right? 
So when does printf know when it's reached the end of a string? When it hits the null terminating character. So in this case, my original pointer points to the beginning of this array. I print the first character out, I move it over one. I print that character out, I move it over, and I keep doing this <coughs> until I reach the end. And now at the end, star pointer will dereference this and get the null terminating character back. And so my while loop runs only when that value is not the null terminating character. So now I exit out of this loop. And so if I subtract 6 from this pointer, I go back all the way to the beginning. And remember, I'm doing this because I have to go to the beginning in order to free it. Okay. So I know that was a lot. Are there any questions? Please, yes. Uh, can you say that louder? Sorry. So on the, on the last slide, uh -huh. um, where you, right before you freeze the pointer, where, where were you actually changing the value of pointer? So right here. So I have a pointer minus minus, right? Which right. moves the thing back one. And then I free it because this pointer has to be pointed <coughs> to the beginning of the array. But that wouldn't be needed had you stopped after the printf line. So if I had stopped after this, this would be considered a memory leak because I didn't run free. I, I know, <coughs> after, like, the first three lines where you're just yeah. doing pointer plus one, uh -huh. pointer So what's the question there? Sorry, no, no, go, go, please. So you would, you're not changing the value of pointer, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have had to do pointer minus minus. Yes. Exactly. So when I do pointer plus one and pointer plus two, I'm not doing pointer equals pointer plus one. So the pointer just stays pointing at the beginning of the ring. It's only when I do plus plus that it sets the value back inside the pointer that it actually moves this along. All right. More questions. Again, if this is sort of overwhelming, this will be covered in section. Ask your teaching fellow about it, and we can answer questions at the end. And usually, we don't like to do this minus thing. And this has to require me keeping track of how much I've offset into the array. So in general, this is just to explain how pointer arithmetic works. But what we usually like to do is we like to create a copy of the pointer. And then we use that copy when we're moving around in the string. So in this case, we use the copy to print the entire string. But we don't have to do like pointer minus equals 6 or keep track of how much we moved in this, just because we know that our original pointer is still pointing to the beginning of the list. And all that we altered was this copy. So in general, alter copies of your original pointer. <coughs> don't try to sort of like, uh, don't alter original copies. Try to alter only copies of your original. So you notice when we pass a string into printf, you don't have to put a star in front of it when we, like we did with like all the other dereferences, right? So if you print out the entire string, <coughs> what a percent s expects is an address, and in this case a pointer, or in this case like an array of characters. Like characters, char stars, and arrays are the same thing. So pointers to characters, and character arrays are the same thing. And so all we have to do is pass in pointer. We don't have to pass in like star pointer or anything. So arrays and pointers are the same thing. When you're doing something like x bracket y over here for an array, what it's doing under the hood is it's saying, OK, it's a character array, so it's a pointer. And so x are the same thing. And so what it does is it adds y to x, which is the same thing as moving forward in memory that much. And now x plus y gives us some sort of address. And we dereference the address or follow the arrow to where that location in memory is, and we get the value out of that location. So these two are exactly the same thing. It's just a syntactic sugar. They do the same thing. They're just different syntactics for each other. So what can go wrong with pointers? Like a lot. Uh, like a lot. OK. So bad things. Some bad things <coughs> you can do are not checking if your malloc call returns null. Right? In this case, I'm asking the system to give me, what is that number, like 2 billion? times 4, because the size of an integer is 4 bytes, I'm asking it for like 8 billion bytes. Of course, my computer is not going to be able to give me that much memory back. And we didn't check if this was null. So when we try to dereference it over there, follow the arrow to where it's going to, we don't have that memory. And this is what we call dereferencing a null pointer. And this essentially causes you to segfault. And it's one of the ways that you can segfault. Other bad things you can do? Oh, well. I. That was dereferencing an old pointer. OK. Other bad things? Well, 
To fix that, you just put a check in there that checks whether the pointer is null and exit out of the program if it happens that malloc returned a null pointer. Okay. SKCD comic. People understand it now? Sort of. Okay. So memory leaks, and I went over this. We're calling malloc in a loop, but every time we call malloc, we're losing track of where this pointer is pointing to because we're clobbering it. So the initial call to malloc gives me memory over here. My pointer points to this. Now I don't <coughs> free it, so now I call malloc again, now it points over here. Now my memory is pointing over here, pointing over here, pointing over here, but I've lost track of the addresses of all the memory over here that I allocated. And so now, I don't have any reference to them anymore, so I can't free them outside of this loop. And so in order to fix something like this, if we forget to free memory, we get this memory leak, we have to free the memory inside of this loop once we're done with it. And well, this is what happens, right? Bad, Firefox. I know lots of you hate this. Um, but now, yay, you get like 44,000 kilobytes. OK, so you free it at the end of the loop, and that's going to just free the memory every time. And essentially, your program doesn't have a memory leak anymore. And now something else you can do is free some memory that you've asked for twice. So in this case, you malloc something, we change its value, we free it once because we said we were done with it. But then we freed it again. This is something that's pretty bad. It's not going to initially segfault, but after a while, what this does is double freeing this corrupts your heap structure. And you'll learn a little bit more about this if you choose to take a class like CS61. But essentially, after a while, your computer is going to get confused about what memory locations are where and where is stored. Uh, where data is stored in memory. And so freeing a pointer twice is a bad thing that you don't want to do. Other things that can go wrong is not using Siza. So in this case, we malloc eight bytes. And that's the same thing as two integers, right? So that, that's perfectly safe. But is it? Well, as Lucas talked about on different <coughs> architectures, integers are of different length. So on the appliance that you're using, integers are, well, four bytes. But on some other system, they might be eight bytes or they might be 16 bytes. So if I just use this number over here, this program might work on the appliance, but it's not going to allocate enough memory on some other system. So in this case, this is what the size of operator is used for. So when we call size of int, what this does is it gives us the size of an integer on the system that the program is running. So in this case, size of int will return four on something like the appliance. And now this will return four times eight, which is uh, four times two, which is eight, which is just the amount of space necessary for two integers. On a different system, if an int is 16, like 16 bytes or 8 bytes, it's just going to return enough bytes to store that amount. Okay, and finally, uh, struct. So if you wanted to store a Sudoku board in memory, how might you do it? You might think of like a variable for the first thing, a variable for the second thing, a variable for the third thing, a variable for the fourth thing. Bad, right? So one improvement you can make on top of this is to make a 9 by 9 array. And that's fine, but what if you wanted to associate other things with the Sudoku board, like what the difficulty of the board is, or for example, what your score is, or how much time it's taken you to solve this board? Well, what you can do is you can create a struct. And what I'm basically saying is I'm defining the structure over here, and I'm defining a Sudoku board, which consists of a board that is 9 by 9. And what it has, it has pointers to the name of the level. It also has x and y, which are the coordinates of where I am right now. It also has the time spent I've played <coughs> the board, and has the total number of moves I've inputted so far. And so in this case, I can group a whole bunch of data into this one structure instead of having it like flying around in like different variables that I can't really keep track of. And this lets us have this nice syntax of sort of referencing different things inside of this struct, right? I can just do board.board .board and I get the Sudoku board back. Board.level, I get you know how tough it is. Board.x, board.y gives me the coordinates of where I might be in the board. And so I'm accessing what we call fields in the struct in this <coughs> method. So this defines Sudoku board, which is a type that I have. And now over here, I have a variable called board of type Sudoku board. And so now I can access all the fields that make up the structure over here. Any questions about structs? Yes? For int x, y, you declare both in one line. Mm -hmm. Yes, you could definitely do that, but the reason I put x and y on the same line, and the question is why can't we just do this on the same line, why don't we just put all of these on the same line, is x and y are in a sense like 
related to each other. And this is just stylistically more correct, in a sense, because it's grouping two things on the same line that like sort of relate to the same thing. And I just <coughs> split these apart. It's just a style thing. It functionally makes no difference whatsoever. OK? Any other questions on structs? You can define a Pokedex with structs. So a Pokemon has a number, it has a level, <coughs> owner, a type. And then if you have a array of Pokemon, you can make up a Pokedex, right? OK, cool. So questions on structs, those are related to structs. And finally, GDB. What does GDB let you do? It lets you debug your program. And if you haven't used GDB, I would recommend watching the short and just going over what GDB is, how you work with it, how you might use it, and test it on a program. And so what, that GD, what GDB lets you do is it lets you pause the execution of your program at a particular line. So for example, I want to pause execution at like line three of my program. And while I'm at line three, I can print out all the values that are there. And so what we call like pausing in a line is we call this putting a breakpoint at that line. And then we can print out the variables at the state of the program at that time. We can then from there stack through the program line by line. And then we can look at the state of the stack at the time. And so in order to use GDB, what we do is we call clang on the C file, but we have to pass it the dash ggdb flag. And once we're done with that, we just run GDB on the resulting output file. And so you get some like massive text like this, but really all you have to do is type in commands at the beginning, break main, puts a breakpoint at main, list 400, lists the lines of code around line 400. And so in this case, you can just look around and say, oh, I want to set a breakpoint at line 397, which is this line. And when your program runs into that step, it's going to break. And it's going to pause there. And you can print out, for example, the value of low or high. And so there are a bunch of commands you need to know. Um, and this slideshow will go up on the website. So if you just want to reference these or like put them on your cheat sheet, feel free. Right. Cool. That was quiz review zero. And we'll stick around if you have any questions. All right.